Hi, I'm Mike, one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor Church. And thank you so much for joining us for this online message in the series of James. As we get started, there's a couple of things we'd love for you to know. First is just our heart behind our digital resources. They are just that, they're resources, but they're not replacement for being in relationship with the people of God. In the season that we're in, with having to be distanced and needing online access, this is a valuable grace from the Lord, but it can never replace being known by the people of God. And even at the end of this message, we're gonna offer you some opportunities that we believe are faithful next steps for you as a follower of Jesus to enter into as being part of community and being known. And then in addition, just a little bit more about James. James is a series where he's encouraging and challenging us to integrate our inner life and our external life. To be people that whether it's having faith that produces action, whether that's being steadfast in the midst of trial, or even the way that we value others because of the image of God in them, that these are things that we don't just think about and believe, but it's also part of the way that we live. And so with that, and there's just beautiful opportunities that we're gonna continue to remind you through because the word of the, of the Lord presents them. And so as we enter in, let's open the word of God together and be expectant for the way that he's gonna shape us. Thank you, worship team. Uh, if you're like, man, I don't recognize those faces. Um, they are part of our student team. And so they are all students and young adults who just have the gift of music and love the Lord and are using that gift uh, to honor him this morning. And so uh, I hope that you're encouraged by that. I know uh, most of these students, I know their parents and their families, and I'm, I'm just, I'm sure moms and dads are super elated as, I, as am I uh, of the way that they're using their gifts. And so hopefully that you entered in with them. And then at the end of our service, you'll enter in with them again as they uh, lead you towards the presence of Jesus. Um, with that in mind, I want to take a moment before we jump into the sermon. Uh, and so a couple of weeks ago, we, we sent out a video letting you know that uh, Church on the Beach is going to begin resuming services starting on December 6th. And so that's a week from today. Um, and But when we, use, when we sent out that video, we didn't just use the word resume. We used this language of relaunch. And this was an opportunity to begin to relaunch some services. And so you're going to even see on the screen some details around uh, what's happening with Church on the Beach. And, and if you want to find out more information where you can go on our website to do that. But I didn't want the opportunity to pass without praying. And so actually right now, uh, they are on the beach. That team is already out praying and they have been for the last several months actually asking the Lord to give them favor, asking the Lord to help them have eyes for the lost. And so uh, they're beginning to pray for that and ask the Lord to do that. And I just wanna give us an opportunity this morning to do the same. And so here in a moment, you're gonna see on the screen, you're gonna see three prayer points and you're just gonna have a few minutes to pray. And we're gonna ask that here's what you would pray for that you'd pray for those who have yet to trust Christ to feel welcomed. Second, that you'd pray for the children's ministry team that's starting out there next week. And then third, that you'd pray for the relaunch materials that they've ordered to arrive before next Sunday so that, they, that way they can use them. And so would you, with those who you are watching with, just take a few moments before the Lord and pray, and then I'll, I'll come back and pray us out in just about, uh, just a little under three minutes.
And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you that we have the opportunity to lean in and pray for the work that you're doing. And Lord, I just ask that you, starting next week, would begin to respond to the prayers that have been prayed, not just for several months, but for a decade plus through the ministry of Church on the Beach. Lord, that there's this desire to be this place uh, amongst the coastal communities of the South Bay where you're drawing people who do not know you to know you. And Lord, I pray that uh, a relaunching, a refreshing of that DNA would start next week where there will be people who are passing by and they'll, they'll choose to enter in and hear the proclamation of the gospel. I pray that people who've maybe thought about it for a long time but haven't been able to stop and stay because they didn't know what to do with their kids, that they would see discipleship of kids going on and that they would enter into it. I pray that there'd be little boys and little girls that drag their mom and dad down the esplanade because they want to be a part of what they see is happening. And Lord, I pray that there would just uh, be this moment uh, where we just understand the definitive work of what you're doing. Uh, Edwards, when he talked about revival, would say that it is the intensification and the acceleration of your, the work of your spirit, the normal work of your spirit. Would you do that starting next week? Would you intensify the gospel footprint? Would you accelerate the reaping of those who do not know you in such a way that we'll look back and we'll just see a marker in the sand of when you decided that you were gonna show out in the coastal communities of the South Bay? And so, Lord, we're asking you to move and Lord, I'm asking you to, to prick the hearts of those who need to be on mission, that people wouldn't choose this as just a, another service option out of many, but they would see it as a place to enter in and be part of the mission of God to draw people unto himself. And so Lord, would you start that work even now? It's in your name I pray, amen and amen. And so again, I mentioned next week we're, we're jumping in. And so uh, I said it in the prayer, but I'll say it to you again. Uh, will, you, will you consider being on mission with the Church on the Beach team and serving alongside them as they're reaching those in the coastal communities of the South Bay? Uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll be going to Genesis chapter one, and we'll be going Genesis one through three here in just a moment. But as we do that, I wanna encourage you, maybe just by some life experience, uh, so when I was a kid, there was a game that we used to play called Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Um, and that game was fantastic. There was a TV show, there were board games, there were all types of stuff. Um, but basically, Carmen Sandiego was this criminal, uh, and you would chase Carmen Sandiego all throughout the world to try and figure out what Carmen Sandiego stole and where she was, and so you could arrest her. And you had like a week's time. And like, that's where I learned the word dossier, because you got a dossier every time you started the game. Like, like I'm all about Carmen Sandiego. And if you're about it, if you go to Google Earth, there's actually a version of Carmen Sandiego. So in your grown up life, you can play Carmen Sandiego. So that's, that is my gift to you in the Christmas. Christmas season. The thing about Carmen San Diego that made the game difficult was you had to know what you were looking for. So they would give you clues about a place or a location or an item. And if you didn't know enough about the item, then the clue was useless for you. It was just information that you passed through, but it actually didn't help you get to you to where you were going. And I think that's important because as we enter into the Christmas season, as we enter into the Christmas at KHC series, we've, no, we've named the series uh, or subtitled it Finding Peace. It's this idea that peace has been laid forth and it needs to be found. But I think one of the principal things we've got to wrestle through is do we even know what we're looking for? And so I'm going to go ahead and give you maybe, maybe not just the punchline for the message, but the punchline for the series Jesus is the answer to the question, where do we find peace? And so here's what we'll do this morning. Uh, we'll actually start in Luke 2, verses 8 through 14, and we're just going to begin to ask the question, what is peace? And we'll actually come back to this text week after week um, because it'll be kind of the, the, the jumping off point as we think about peace being found in our world. And then in Genesis 1 and 2, we're going to just take this journey from chaos to completion and then in Genesis chapter three, we're gonna see what sin has cost us. And so I know we prayed for church on the beach, but let me pray one more time uh, and just echo what was prayed at the end of our time of worship together. Lord, would you open our hearts to hear, receive, and respond as we walk through your word. And to your name I pray, amen. So Luke chapter two, starting in verse 14, or starting in verse eight, going through verse 14 would say this. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel, or there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. Or some other versions would say peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And I want to take some time to make some sense out of what the angel was claiming here and what the heavenly host were singing here. That this angel would show up to these shepherds, and it's interesting, and we'll take some time as we walk through the series to even think through about the shepherds and where they're at, and thinking about it was just an unlikely people in an unlikely place on, on the, the parched plains of Israel to hear that the Lord is bringing his glory. But it wasn't just the physical location, it was the contextual location of them being occupied by Rome and being less than what they thought they were going to be as a kingdom. All of these reasons, when you see angels show up and begin to declare that the glory of God is here, that he's answering that his, his promises, and that there's going to be peace on earth and goodwill towards men, it probably would have been a little bit shocking for them. It probably would have felt odd to them knowing that they'd been occupied by so many different nations that the, Greek had, the Greeks had had power over them and then the Romans that they weren't what they thought they were going to be when they heard the promises of, of the kingdom of David having a king that would never lose his rule and his reign but yet they had this guy named Herod who wasn't even really one of them that was leading them. This would have seemed odd to say that there's peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And in a unique way, we are probably more aware of how distant it feels from that promise than we've ever been before. And so like, if we just started thinking through 2020 and thinking about peace, and let's just think about it on different levels, because I mentioned this last week that you exist on multiple levels. You're not just a body. You're not just a person in a community. You're not just a soul. You're all of these things. And then all of these things have different layers of peace that are important. And so maybe one of the layers that we, and maybe the most important layer is just this idea of peace with God. That in 2020, if we were going to take a measurement, maybe not even outside of the church, but just in the church, uh, how reconciled, how tight is our relationship to God? Uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous. Ligonier Ministries did a study called the State of Theology for 2020. Um, and these are people who profess to trust Jesus Here's some of the things that they said um, that are a little concerning in the survey they did. 28% of people strongly agreed with the idea that Jesus was just a great teacher, but he was not God. And there's only 27% of people who strongly disagreed. That I, there's something a little off in our relationship with Jesus if more people think that he was just a man than people who ardently are opposed to that idea. Or here's uh, another one that uh, made me a little nervous. 65% of people that took this survey uh, either strongly agreed or somewhat agreed uh, that everyone sins a little bit, but by, the, by most in general, most people are good by nature. And so again, this idea of sin is just kind of be this little uh, personality quirk that you have. It's not actually this corruption of your nature. And so that actually speaks to lack of necessity for the cross. And Jesus just needs to be a good teacher. He doesn't need to be God stepping in our place. And so even if we're just talking about peace with God, there's something off here. Or, or maybe let's, let's get out of the relationship with God. Let's just talk about us. How many articles have you seen? How many headlines have you seen that in 2020 that there's been this rise of emotional disturbance or mental illness or the preponderance of suicide has increased in such a way that is alarming? How many times have you uh, maybe felt in and of yourself anxious or depressed or jostled in your soul? And so to hear angels say, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, we feel really distant from that promise. Or maybe even as we look at the, the world around us, and so maybe not just as an individual, but even as members of a community, how often do we feel like there's lack of peace? Like if we just look at the last 10 months in this nation between racial unrest, between the ways that of the political season divided people against one another, and the ways that people are in this scarcity mentality and stealing all the Clorox wipes from Target, like we are not people who are at peace with one another. 
And we can roll that out just outside of the United States and then all over the world we can see pockets of unrest. I was reading just yesterday about in Ethiopia, the Tagali people are, are, are against the government and there seems to be this divide, this growing feeling of like regional unrest that could lead to war. And these are all types of things that are happening in the world around us that show that there doesn't seem to be goodwill towards one another. And then we can take it a layer even broader and let's just think about the unrest that we seem to have with creation. In just our state, the, the number of fires and the acreages that were burned over the late fall in, or the late summer into the fall. Think about hurricanes that occurred all across the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. Think about all the different ways that we've seen, uh, and I haven't even mentioned coronavirus yet, that to hear a promise of peace on earth and goodwill towards men feels like it's so incredibly distant from us. And so I think it's important that we define what we're looking for. Because I think the way that we think about peace is often lack of war. And if that was our definition, then we as a nation aren't in, engaged in any uh, stated, declared conflict, and so there's a level of peace there, but yet we, it doesn't feel like we feel peace. Or we could think about peace as being uh, the relationship between friends, the good-naturedness between friends, and, and I'm sure we have some of that in our lives, but even in this season, it's felt like it's harder to engage that because we've been distant from people, and so even that level of peace doesn't feel like it's real. And so when the Bible talks about peace, it includes those things, but it's actually thinking about something much bigger. So the definition that we'll be using during this series for peace uh, comes from the, the Lexham Theological Word Book, and it just says this. Peace denotes the wholeness, soundness, and well-being that characterizes God and, that God, and that, that God created in the world. As peace was broken due to human sin, such well-being constitutes the hope of ultimate restoration by God. So they speak of peace not just as this thing that you feel or just this kind of state of affairs, but it's actually this characteristic of, of God, and it's from God that holds all of these things together. Another way to think about it is think about the complex parts of your life and the way that the complex parts of your life might be held together by one singular unifying thing. So I grew up, uh, particularly in middle school, playing clarinet, and um, I was thinking about this because I, I had preached about clarinet a while back and all these people came to me to try and give, tell me about great clarinet players, Benny Goodman in particular, and I was not convinced. Uh, but I remember playing clarinet and I remember being part of the ensemble band in the concert season. And I remember that it, you could have all of these parts and when they were unified together, it was beautiful. You could have the clarinet section. You could have the trumpet section. You could have, uh, you could have the flutes. You could have all of these different instruments. And, the, and though there were different parts, they were making one sound. And when it came all together, it was this peaceful sounding, beautiful, unified thing. But it was middle school band. And so inadvertently, somebody was going to mess that piece up. Somebody was going to squeak because they didn't put on their reed right, or somebody was going to try and make a funny sound with their trombone slide. And all of a sudden, all those pieces that were being held together by rhythm and intonation and all those things, all of a sudden that was broken by one small thing destroying that. All of these complex parts no longer had their unity, and so that peace was gone. The way the Bible would talk about it in the Old Testament or the Old Testament word for that is shalom. It's this idea of wholeness and oneness. And this is the idea of what the scriptures are talking about when the angels declare that there'll be peace on earth. So let's look at what that actually looked like. Genesis chapter one, verses one and two would say this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so when you open up the pages of your Bible, and, and it's funny because I was telling my wife what I was preaching, and she said, are you preaching Genesis 1 through 3 again? I feel like you preach it once a quarter. And it's funny because I preached it back in June, and I'll probably preach it next year in March. So like it's, it's just going to come for you. There is this reality that when you open the pages of your Bible— what we see is this picture of chaos. 
Now, when you see water in the scriptures, it's often the sign of judgment, the sign of death, the sign of chaos. And the way that we're entered in the scriptures is that, the, that there's no form to anything, that there's water and chaos, and it's not what it should be. And the Lord enters into that, and he begins to start setting things in order. And so verse 2 should be comforting for your soul that the Spirit of God was above sitting, um, uh, administrating over the face of the deep. And as we begin to read through chapter one, we get to see this picture of the layers of the way that the Lord was taking all of these complex things and making them one and making them function. And so one of those layers is just that in the first three days that he's just forming an environment, that he's separating the waters, that he's separating the sky, that he's separating out the land, that he's setting up something that can be entered into. And then days four through six, we begin to see him begin to put things in there to fill it, to make sure that it had life in it. And so whether that's filling it with vegetation or filling it with wildlife or filling it with people, that he's building together these complex pieces and that when he gets to the end of that, when he finally does all that he's doing, that Genesis 1.31 would say it this way. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And so what I love about that is each day the Lord is saying, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. But the sixth day that he says, very good. I, I, when I was working at the village, they offered some theology classes, and one of them was the Old Testament class. And so I, I was in the Old Testament class, and when we got to this text, the guy that was leading it was, said, hey, you know when you read in your Bible that it doesn't actually say in the original language, very good. It actually just says good, good. And what, you know, it was early in the morning, and I was hearing that, and I was like, I am, it is too early, and I am too sleepy to fully grasp what you're saying to me. And so maybe that's where you're at this morning, and so let me just explain to you why that's important. That this idea of good, good is this idea of this is, as, this is good of good. This is the best of the best. This is the fullness. This is the completeness. This is something to be excited about because it's whole and it's complete. So much so that the Lord decided to rest after he did what he finished on the sixth day. We've moved from this picture of chaos and death and danger to this picture of the Lord saying that this is the best of the best, the good of the good, that this is something that I can sit back and see flourish because I've set up something that's complete. In fact, Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3 would say it this way. Thus the heaven and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And I love that one of the things that seems to come with this shalom, this completeness, this wholeness, this soundness, is this sense of rest. And let me just speak to our moment. Maybe that's a good litmus test. If, if, we're, if we're believing that there's peace that's available, if we're believing, if, if the punchline of this is that Jesus is the answer to the question of where we find peace, then maybe a, a telltale symptom of whether we have peace or not is how rested or unrested we might feel. Because when the Lord had completed his work and saw the shalom that he had set in place, he was able to rest. And the Bible would be a really nice fairy tale if it ended after those verses. The rest of chapter two begins to give us a deeper dive into specifically the creation of humanity. But then when we get to chapter three, chapter three shows us why what they had isn't what we have because sin got in the way. And in fact, when we jump into chapter three, um, at the end of chapter two, the Lord had spoken to them and said, hey, I, you can eat any of the fruit of this garden except for this one particular tree. And where we pick up is at the start of, Gen at the start of Genesis three is that we're staring at this particular tree with Eve and the serpent. 
It's the same way that um, there's this impulse in us that when you see wet paint that you want to touch it, or when you tell your kids, hey, don't grab that cookie, that the one thing that they want to do is grab that cookie, that somehow we get into Genesis 3, and even though there's all of this pleasure, all of this goodness, all of the gifts of grace of God in this place in the garden where he walks with them and cares for them, the one thing that we see Eve doing is she's standing at the tree hearing the serpent say to her, the Lord's holding out on you. You're not going to surely die. If you eat it, you will be like him, which is just a tragic lie because she was already like him, made in his image and likeness, and yet she was trying to figure out how to do that on her own. And so she takes of the fruit and she eats it and she gives it to her husband. And then we begin to see the picture of what sin cost us, starting in Genesis 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And I don't want to move too quickly past that because I want you to capture something that's going on and maybe a layer of unrest that we're seeing happen because sin entered the picture. So the, the work of what sin does is that sin creates this separation, this fracture in, the relationship, in our relationship with God, it, it, but it also has some ramifications on us on very different levels. And we see the first one in these first few verses, that all of a sudden, Adam and Eve are beginning to emote these feelings that are foreign to what we've read in the entirety of the scriptures. Never before in the first two chapters do we see anybody afraid. Never before do we see anybody trying to cover themselves. In fact, it would say that when Adam and Eve were standing together, that they were standing together and they were naked and they were unashamed, that there wasn't this feeling of needing to cover themselves. And then all of a sudden, they sin against the Lord, and all of a sudden, something in them is aware in a way that makes them feel like they need to go hide themselves. Something in them is, is, is aware that not only do they need to hide the, themselves physically, but they need to hide themselves from the Lord, that something is being evoked, that something's being broken on the inside. The peace that they used to feel of being whole and being right before the Lord all of a sudden is gone when they partook of the fruit. Then hear more ramifications of sin and the other layers that it disrupts. So the woman, he said, this is the Lord speaking. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. And for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So we've already seen that this level of peace of mind that they used to have is gone, that, that's been fractured and broken. They no longer have that level of peace. But now we're seeing some other ways that, they're, that this complexity of life is no longer being unified. And so we hear very quickly that Eve is all of a sudden going to have a, a desire contrary to her husband, and her husband is going to rule or domineer over her. And so now instead of having this relationship that's characterized by unity, now we've got this division, these contrary desires and this sense of domineering. Here's another layer that now they're not just broken within themselves, they seem to be broken with the other person that's closest to them. And then the, the third layer is that there's this inability to fulfill their role that God called them to. 
So the Lord speaks a couple of things to them. When Adam and Eve are together, he says, I'm calling you to be fruitful and multiply, that I've given you my image, that you have a relationship with me, but you also represent me, that you have my image, representation, likeness, that this, this relationship, and you're meant to carry out both of these things. And all of a sudden, sin makes it really difficult to carry out the role of being representatives. So they were, still had the image, but they couldn't represent what they were imaging very faithfully. And we see that because this ability to be fruitful and multiply, what was meant to be painless, what was meant to be something of celebration and the multiplication of the image of God all throughout the earth, that all of a sudden it was going to be wrought with pain. This other call was that they were supposed to subdue the earth and to guard it and to keep it. And all of a sudden, Adam can't do his job very well. He's got to struggle that it, by the sweat of his brow that it's going to wear him out to do the thing that God called him to do. All of a sudden, they can't fulfill their purpose like they thought they were going to fulfill their purpose because that's one of the ramifications of sin. And then just to throw one small one in there, death. So we see this picture of the way that sin has broken peace and cost us on so many different levels. And I'm kind of out of notes, so I guess we'll just have to sit in that until next week. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm not gonna do that to you. But what do we do with that? What do we do with the realization that we've inherited brokenness within us, brokenness around us and brokenness, even as we try to uh, lead creation the way that we were called to be those who led creation. And we just can't do it. It seems like both my main idea and the statement of the angels that Jesus is the answer to the question where we find peace doesn't seem like it's enough. What do, we, what do we do? What do we do with these angels, this heavenly host singing out that there's glory to God in the highest, that there's supposed to be peace on earth, and we've identified all the ways that we don't feel any type of peace. There's supposed to be goodwill towards one another, and, and it's really easy for us to struggle to find that also. Where, what do we do with the reality that that's broken? And so let me just share a thought and just tell you how it fleshes out. I think there's a danger of trying to attack symptoms without getting to the source. A few years back, I had a sinus infection, and I'm, I'm sure I've had them before, but I don't know that I knew it was a sinus infection. And so I was uh, a community group minister at the time, and I was uh, meeting with two of my group leaders, and I, like, I was sitting in their home, and, my, and the group leader looked at me and she's like, you look awful. And I was like, thank you for your kind words and encouraging me. And she's like, no, like, I know you said you got like a, a head cold or some sniffles, but I think you got something worse. And so as I started describing my symptoms, she was like, you, you have a sinus infection. And I was like, no, nah, it's just a head cold. I'll just keep taking Ricola and, you know, drinking hot tea and I should be fine. Three weeks later, I finally went and did something about my sinus infection. And it wasn't that I wasn't doing anything before but I was just attacking symptoms. And so my nose running, my, my throat being a little scratchy, I thought, okay, I can just get some hot tea that'll dry that up. I can just take some Ricola and that way I don't have a cough running. And I was, I was managing the symptoms really, really well. And at the same time, I was just getting worse and worse because I wasn't attacking the source of the problem. And I think the hard thing about finding peace is that if we don't know what we're looking for, we're going to do a really good job of attacking all of the symptoms of our brokenness and never actually get to the source of what's wrong. And so here's how that often plays out. And it's especially true in seasons like Christmas where we try and medicate ourselves with getting new things in boxes because we think we're going to feel better. And then when the new wears off, we're exhausted and we're back in the same place we were before. And so one of those is, trying to find completeness and self-help. There's a reason that if you could walk into a Barnes and Noble right now, that the biggest section of Barnes and Noble is the self-help section. Because it's this idea, if I could make myself better, if I could try harder, if I could figure this out, if I could make myself whole, that all of a sudden what's going on in me will be better. But the reality is there is not enough books that you can read. There's not enough uh, places in Barnes and Noble that you can go to to find self-help to make you whole because that's just the symptom. It's actually not the source of the lack of peace. Or, or maybe a second one, trying to find completeness through relationships. 
And we have done this ever since we were little kids. And so when you were trying to sit at the cool kids table or trying to be in the in group, and let me just tell you, uh, for those of you who are still in that season of life, we're trying to be there. When you grow up, there is no cool kids table. But there's this reality that if we can be around the right people, if we can be in the right group, if we could look like them or talk like them, or I, I remember because I, I'm a kid of, of the late 90s into the 2000s that we had that era where everybody became golf because it was this sign of being uh, just an individual, except you had a bunch of people who were dressed exactly alike who were trying to be individuals. And there's this reality that that matures into that if I date the right person or marry the right person or have enough sex with the right people or get seen the right way, that if, if I can get that, then I'm going to be whole. And just the reality is there's not enough invites, there's not enough sexual relationships, there's not enough acclaim from other people that's actually going to make you whole. Or maybe it's not making yourself better. Maybe it's not relying on relationships with other people. Maybe you've seemed to find it in accomplishing things that every trophy you get, you think this is the one that's going to make me okay. That if I, if I could just get enough A's on that report card, and maybe it's your school report card, or maybe it's the report card of life. Maybe it's getting the corner office. Maybe it's having enough money in the, the account. Maybe it's going on that vacation. Maybe it's living in that neighborhood. If I could just get enough stuff, I'm going to be okay. But I'm just going to give you a little bit of theology from Diana Ross. The reality is more money, more problems. That just because you're trying to accomplish more things or have more money in the bank account or achieve more, that at the end of the day, you just have more stuff to worry about and stay up at night with lack of rest. And maybe the most insidious one is moral behavior. So this is self-help wearing a choir robe. This is this idea that if I could just make myself better by doing moral things, I won't be like those people because they're immoral. I won't do that. And sometimes we clothe it up and if I could have enough church attendance and go to enough Bible studies and do enough things, if I can do all of that, then I'm a good person and I'm going to be whole. And then all of a sudden, when you don't get peace from that, you begin to question the faithfulness of God. And this can be the most traumatic one because when you hear that it's not about proving yourself to be good enough because you did enough good things, then you all of a sudden are left without an ability to figure out what to do next because somebody changed the playbook and you used to be good at the old plays. But the reality is that over and over again, these things end up being empty boxes with beautiful bows that don't have peace in them. And so where do we find peace? In the middle of all the brokenness of Genesis 3, we see a promise that gives us hope. Genesis 3.15 would say this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. So this is the Lord God speaking to the serpent and the final part of verse 15 is where we begin to find this peace. That he, the seed of woman, shall bruise the serpent's head and you, the serpent, will bruise his heel. And in this moment, uh, theologians call this the, the first proclamation of the gospel. It's the first time that God says, hey, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to restore. I'm going to fix the breach between you and me. You can't fix it. And so I am going to send one that can fix it. And it's this picture of saying, yeah, he's going to suffer on your behalf, but he's also going to crush the one that's causing you to suffer, that he is going to make things whole in a way that no one else can make things whole. And so when the angels crack the sky and begin to sing glory to God in the highest, that there's going to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. They're saying God is finally attacking the source because you are going to be incapable if you just keep playing with the symptoms. And so we're leading you shepherds, unlikely people in an unlikely place at a concerning time to know and believe that the goodness of God has come on your behalf and you will find it in a manger and swaddling cloth and his name will be Jesus and he will be the one that will lead you to peace. And so can I say to you this morning as you're watching that Jesus 
is the answer, and that is not a trite cliche. It's the reality that nothing else could be. And you feel that down in your guts because if the the diagnosis of the litmus test might be the lack of rest that you feel, it's because helping yourself or finding the right person to be with or doing enough things or proving yourself to be good enough, they all leave you exhausted and empty. But when Jesus comes, he provides for you what you could not provide for yourself. He crushes the head of the serpent who's deceived over and over again, and he takes upon himself the brokenness that we deserve that he might be the one that holds all these complex pieces of our life together that we might be whole. And so I just want to invite you to trust him. And you may be watching and you might be saying, hey, I already have, I've prayed that prayer. Uh, the gospel is not just your starting point. It's the thing that continues to carry you through. And I'll just tell you, if you think that doing things on your own, by your own power to make yourself better is going to be what makes you finally have peace, that's the most anti-gospel notion you could ever believe. But the Spirit of God, because of the resurrection of Jesus, has now placed in you a new heart that allows you to pursue him in faithfulness and with peace. So what I want to do is I want to pray. And I want to give us an opportunity as we enter into communion to begin to think through the ways that sin has crushed and cost us and then begin to cry out to Jesus for Jesus to be our peace. Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. You are not the hollow, empty promises of self-help or relationships or accomplishments or even the ways that I think that I, if I can prove myself to be good enough. But Lord, you can hold the weight of my hope. You have the unifying ability to bring peace. It's your character, not just something that you pass out. And so for myself and for so many others that are listening in this moment, would you enter in and begin to bring shalom, to bring this wholeness, this soundness, this unity in the areas of life. Because from there, we'll find the absence of conflict. From there, we'll find this feeling of being at rest. From there, we'll find this feeling of being able to say that even within ourselves, that we have this peace of mind. And so, Lord, would you, would you grant us that because you've come near? Would you help us to trust you for that? Some maybe for the first time. Others, would you remind us that you are always worthy of our trust? It's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. After experiencing God's word together, the next question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? The desire is not that you would just get information. In our culture, you can be a fan or you can be in close proximity and not actually follow. But to follow Jesus means to live out what he's called you to. And so we think that a next important step for you as a follower of Jesus is to be in community. That means living out what the Bible calls us to, not just as these inner ideas, but actually being married to our external actions. This is what we see all throughout James, that whether it's faith and action, whether it's being steadfast in trial, it's what we believe being manifested, played out in the ways that we actually live. And so for those who are in close proximity to us, our hope is that you would enter into community to be known, to be seen, to care for one another. And we'd love to connect you in that step. And for those that are a little farther off and aren't close to us, in any ways that we can, we'd love to partner you with a church that's near you, somewhere we might have a relationship. And so please contact us for that as well. Another way that we take what's happening in us and living it outwardly, the way that we show that we're actually following Jesus is that every area of our life is his. And so whether that's financially, whether that's the way that we spend our time, whether that's the trajectory of our dreams, we're saying, Lord, use me how you want to. And so a follower of Jesus is faithful in their giving and faithful in their going. 
And we want to invite you to do that. Give to the mission of God and make yourself available to be a part of where he wants to show the gospel next. And then we don't believe that you're meant to do this on your own. And so in any ways that we can be praying for you, connecting you, supporting you, we want to do that. So please contact us and let us know how we can serve you. We can't wait to see what the Lord's going to do next. We love you.